You're listening to Forward, a podcast from faculty at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, hosted by Michelle Knight, Josh Jipp, Madison Pierce, and James Arcadi. Forward invites listeners into the mission of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School through conversations with faculty, staff, and guests. Hey, welcome to Forward. Um, I'm James Arcadi, hanging out here with Michelle Knight. We got a great interview uh, to to share with you all today. But uh, Michelle, you know, we got spring break coming up here um, fairly Indeed. soon, and this mm-hmm. will be a spring like a spring break, unlike other spring breaks, except for last year, I guess. But um, we can't really <laughs> go anywhere too crazy. No. And, and, I no. really wouldn't go anywhere that crazy anyway. But uh, I was wondering, like, you know, in the future, what are some of your, like, you know, bucket list places to go to if you were to have a cool spring break down the road yeah. post-COVID? I mean, I can answer that. Yeah, I can answer that so quickly. I want to go to the Bodleian, and I want to go, like, tomorrow. Uh, I just yeah. want to sit in the Oxford Library and be in the Oxford Library. I want to breathe the air that the Oxford, the Oxford Library, you know, puts out. Did- I want that. Did you know that I've I've been in the Bodleian Library? No, uh, tell me about him. I mean, I ju- when I was an is undergrad, that a, is that I, the end of the story? <laughs> I did a semester study there, and you know, Radcliffe I camera every day, pretty much, and it it was it was awesome. You know what, uh, James? I also have it on good authority that at one point you ate part of Oxford, and I feel like you need to explain that. That 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 is. I mean, I was young. I was uh, you know naive a little bit. <laughs> Um, you know, and there was a little bit of Cotswold stone off the side of the building and I just sort of like mm-hmm. took a finger fill and I don't know what provoked me, but I, uh, I consumed a, a bit of, of, of Oxford Cotswold and, and so now it's, it's a part of me somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's something. That's really something. I mean, these are certainly going to be among the top, uh, dorky destinations for travel, but I'd also love to hear yours. Where, where would you go, James, if you could go anywhere after this pandemic? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I am, I'm a warm climate kind of dude. And so, you know, when it, sure. when it comes to this time of the year, it's like, I kind of forgot what it was like to walk outside and it'd be warmer than it is inside. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it would be South, it, whether that's, you know, <laughs> back to California, whether that's, I don't know, Florida, which I've not spent much time in. I mean, the Caribbean would be great. And it can be nerdy. Chile. I mean, I can bring books, so it can be nerdy. I just want to be warm. Good point. <laughs> yes. So you can make it nerdy. No, that's a good point. You can read there. I mean, like, are you, have you and your family ever gone on a beach vacation? Like, uh, is that what we're looking for? A, a beach vacation? Well, I mean, uh, not like a like a resort beach kind of vacation, okay. but I will say okay. that my family, yeah. like my 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 family, my kids and everything, our first camping experience as a family was at the beach. This is out in California, up near Malibu. Oh. Uh, we did a couple of okay. nights uh, on the beach, which was which is great and super dirty because you get sand everywhere and and the like. But, I imagine. Yeah, that sounds but, terrible. Uh, yeah, that's fun. And we we did we did. I'm just kind of rambling, but we did do camping on the beach on Lake Michigan's beach as well, just this last summer. So we've had like the the, the saltwater beach camping experience and the freshwater beach <laughs> camping experience. Well, now uh, for anybody interested in beach camping, we know that we have a resident expert, so we can send them your way. Yeah, my advice, That's don't something. go with three kids. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, uh, though we aren't going anywhere soon, we are really looking forward to our upcoming interview with Dr. Max Lee, who is a professor of New Testament at North Park Theological Seminary. Uh, But he is part of our Trinity community because he is serving at the Henry Center as a fellow this year. So we have been able to really enjoy being around him and we are really excited to introduce him to you in just a minute. So stay tuned. Welcome to Forward, a TED's faculty podcast. I'm James Arcadi. And I'm Michelle Knight. 
Today, we are thrilled to have with us a very special guest, Dr. Max Lee, uh, who is a professor of New Testament at North Park University here in the Chicago land. Um, but we have the privilege of hosting him here for this academic year at Trinity, uh, where he's a research fellow in the Creation Project at Trinity's uh, Carl F.H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding, uh, where he's uh, working on a project on, uh, I believe the title is Natural Desire, Moral Indexes, and Pleasure According to Paul, which I'm thrilled to hear uh, a bit more about. So, uh, Dr. Lee, I know you've been a bit of a listener uh, to Forward, so I'm, I'm really glad that uh, you're here. We're delighted to have you here on the show. Well, it's great to be here, and I am a fan, so thank you very much. But I feel like I've already <laughs> know the podcast crew uh, by all the episodes I've listened to. Well, that. that's great. Well, we're getting, looking forward to getting to know you uh, a bit better um, as well. And, and maybe that's a good place to start. Perhaps you might just tell us a little bit about, um, about your background, uh, how you came into doing New Testament studies. Um, I happen to notice uh, that you have uh, degrees from three institutions in my home state of California. So if you want to say anything nice about the Golden State, I'm very open <laughs> sure, to that sort of absolutely. <laughs> line of questioning. Think I think about California all the time now during the winter in Chicago. We're Me single too. Digits. I imagine. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think uh, so. I, I'm in Chicago, and uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife Sue, we've been living in Chicago land for 17 years now. So it, going on 18. So it's home. And my okay. uh, two sons, one who's gradu just graduated from college, and the other uh, younger one is a sophomore in college. They are Chicago raised, so the Midwest has been a great home for us. Um, but I, my roots are in California. Um, I'm a second gen Korean American, uh, born in San Francisco, grew up in the East Bay in a city called Richmond. Uh, son of immigrant parents, and I think um, one way to put my life is I've always been surrounded by really intense Christians. So one of my mm. favorite memories is uh, my mom waking me up around four or five in the morning mm. uh, because she is just crying out to God. She, I, I like to say that she wakes up the sun with her prayers. Wow. And so, um, oh my goodness. And, but, but sometimes it really made me nervous because she would yell out my name and I'm going, ooh, what's she praying me, about me for? Uh, uh, but uh, so I grew up in a Christian home, uh, but I, I think I didn't have my own faith until actually I went to the University of California, Berkeley. Mm. Uh, met another intense group of Christians. Um, they were back then called the Korean Baptist Student Union. Hmm. And uh, they later became more broadly the Asian Baptist Student Koinia. But I had gone to Berkeley thinking that I was going to make a name for myself. There's an 80s term called gunner, and I, and I was definitely a gunner. I wanted to <laughs> pave my own path. And along the way, I forgot all about Christ and what mm. my parents had taught me growing up. Um, but I'm really grateful that uh, KBSU at that time reached out to me. Uh, they uh, kept inviting me to Bible studies. I ignored them for a year. And my sophomore year, I decided to go. And I, I went, went through some intense soul searching. And to make a long story short, I really just surrendered my whole life to Christ my sophomore year in college. And it's mm. been a grand adventure since then. Um, <laughs> I spent my junior year uh, at Machida Christian Center in Tokyo, Japan. So I, there was a need for an English teacher and I grabbed it. And then it was a it was really formative because when I came back, I decided that I wasn't going to go to medical school. I mm. really did break my parents' heart when I did that. Mm. And I decided I felt that I had a, instead a call to ministry. And so that took me to Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. We got my MDiv. I went there. I think I'd be a pastor. And I think a big fork in the road for me came when the pastor of the church I was serving at thought that while I would be a good pastor— I, I would make for a better scholar. And I think this is where my story might be really different from hmm. what other um, people who've sought out theological education, their vocational paths are. So I want to say that my path is not a, a typical. It's actually quite atypical. Hmm. But I, um, I had applied to a couple of places, and I got accepted to the PhD program at Fuller. And I also got accepted to the THM program at Harvard Divinity School. Mm -hmm. And I had a choice where um, if I were going to pursue the PhD and think about theological education, that uh, which place would I go? And the church that we were part of 
and the and the campus ministry that we were part of, the same uh, group that helped me to find Christ or be found by Christ and mm. discipled me, they were going to start a church plant in the Los Angeles area. Mm. And so I had a choice to go to the Harvard Divinity School route for the THM or uh, join a church plant and and be part of the PhD program at Fuller. So what I mean by atypical is that um, for the eight years I was Fuller doing the PhD, seven of those years was bivocational. It was only mm-hmm. in the last year that the pastor wow. at that time thought that we got to get you through this program and you got to finish. Mm-hmm. So I took a year off to finish the dissertation, but I was always bivocational. And so my wife and I, we did college ministry, campus ministry with uh, ABSK for those years. And it, it's, it was a great time. Um, I think I remember taking, when my kids were born, I, I you know, I'd, we, we, we dragged them everywhere with us. And I, I, I blew up my car driving from Los, one part of Los Angeles to mm-hmm. Riverside to mm-hmm. uh, down Irvine, anyone in California, I think James would appreciate how far those distances are. Um, es- especially in traffic. Yeah, it's a lot of traffic, <laughs> a lot of driving. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, what it did was it, the church was always in my heart mm. and whatever kind of teaching I would do, it'd be to form pastors and leaders in the church. I really wanted mm. uh, to, to teach in a way that informed and equipped uh, the work of the ministry and the, and the mission of the church. So from Fuller, uh, and I had a great great set of supervisors. So um, Judy Gundry, who's now at Yale, and then Se Yun Kim were on my dissertation committee. I love them both, and I learned a lot from them. Um, I went to, my first teaching was actually um, at Westmont College for a year, was sabbatical replacement. Then I went to Wheaton College. That was the big mid- Midwest move. And I yeah. taught there as okay. a visiting professor for three years. And then after the visiting professor was over, my, I landed my first tenure track position at North Park Theological Seminary. And I've been there since 2006. And so that's my story. Amazing. And that's... <laughs> um, all I can say is that uh, I was discipled by such an intense Baptist group that made the Pharisees yeah. and navigators look like slackers. <laughs> so it, it was just an intense group. And my, and that's where I met my wife. We, we met at Berkeley. We're part of the same ministry. And so I, we kind of have the same spiritual history and heritage. Amazing. So. I'm, I'm just interested. I mean, how does that intensity play out for you? You've, you've emphasized it several times during your testimony. I just mm-hmm. can't help but follow up. Right. What, why is that so important to you? Oh, well, uh, well, I think dispositionally, I'm a very intense person, so it kind of fits my character well. <laughs> Um, But um, I think for me, what was important was um, I learned very early on, especially with my mom praying the way she does. Because, I I mean, who wakes up at four in the morning to pray for an hour until five so that she can get to work by six? And I was a latch kid. I knew how hard both my parents worked. Um, And then to find a group of college students who love the Bible so much that, you know, know, when we have retreats, they're they're intense. When uh, we were committed to... Uh, re- having daily devotionals, meeting together during weekdays for Bible study. Uh, we just mm. spent life together and, and that really formed me. And I think um, I learned on that if I was going to follow Christ, it would demand my whole life. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I'm grateful that I, got, I received that kind of message. Uh, I didn't get a watered down gospel. Mm. And um, I'm that a sinner. Sense. So how should I, you know, do I live that out fully as I should? Absolutely no way. But it's also that in those moments of failure and uh, that I feel the Holy Spirit just pulls me up and uh, says, cool. uh, let's get back to it. Uh, and grace <laughs> covers over a multitude of sins. So, mm. Mm. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's great. I well, love hearing the story. It's great. Yeah, I'm so glad you shared it. Well, part of why we've had you on the podcast today, and James already touched on this, uh, is to highlight the work that you are doing with the Henry Center. Mm. So could you tell our listeners just a little bit about the fellowship and why it appealed to you, what what it means to be working with the Henry Center? Mm. Yeah. Um, so the Henry Center is, um, uh, it it it's part, well, I've only known the Henry Center through its current project, the Creation Project, which yeah. is uh, supported by the John Templeton Foundation. And uh, what it's doing now is it's, it provides uh, fellowships for scholars uh, and invites them to come on campus. In fact, it's, it is a residential fellowship. So you, part of the experience is being here at the Trinity campus, engaging with other fellows or other scholars who've been awarded mm-hmm. the fellowship. And uh, we're engaged in the work on the integration between science and religion. Uh, 
uh, or science and theology. Actually, uh, in a very explicit way, the Henry Center is explicitly an evangelical uh, theological institution. Okay. So it, it does very much want right. um, scholars who are committed to the work of the church to be engaging in the area of science and, uh, and theology and its intersections. Um, and so I found out about it um, through my former dean, who's now the provost of Moody uh, B Bible Institute. So that's uh, Dwight uh, Perry. Uh, he was okay. our dean of faculty at North Park, and he grabbed the flyer from the, Hen uh, the Henry Center, says, Max, I think you'd be really interested in it. And I was working okay. on, on the idea of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I read the project and, I, and what I was interested in and what the fellowship was for and the fact that my sabbatical a year was coming up and that the Henry Fellowship actually provides um, uh, monetary support for a full year off, academic year off. Um, I applied, talked with uh, um, Jeffrey, uh, um, uh, Jeffrey Fulkerson of the director of the program and uh, found out more about it, uh, prepared my application, it was accepted and um, here I am. So I'm here for the academic year. I was here for fall. Uh, 2020. I'll be here for spring 2021. I'm working on a project on the theory of pleasure. I think it's an important topic for the church and how, how we can enjoy God good good gifts, but also not let it mm -hmm. turn into idolatrous and addictive practices. So that's the project. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in what the health sciences say about pleasure and how it operates. I think we, part of the problem of being responsible with pleasure and enjoying it as, as a gift from God is that we don't know how pleasure works. And so hmm. that's part of the project that I'm doing. Um, I'm surrounded by some really great colleagues. So uh, just a shout out to Alex Stewart, who is in the area of Old Testament. He's working on a project called Wonder. Kevin Kinghorn, Professor Philosopher Asbury, is working on the area of moral intuitions, what our, hmm. whether our gut gets it right about uh, what's right and wrong. Josh Shipp. Um, you know, actually, I don't know if his project's that important, so I kind of forgot about it. No, I'm, I'm just, sure it's <laughs> I'm just not important. Kidding. No, nobody it's... on this podcast needs to hear about Josh Chip. Okay, no, but, but Josh that? is. I haven't uh, heard like, of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a professor, professor at TEDS, as y'all know. I'm sure a wonderful <laughs> colleague, and he's working on the project on, on human flourishing in Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. I think the best part about the Henry Center is it provides a space for research, the resources to to for what we need to learn more about a project. Um, we meet every day for coffee hour, we bounce ideas. I'm, I love talking with Alex and Kevin and Josh about our work and other things under the sun. Um, we have a lunch where we present uh, kind of draft chapters of the work that we're doing. Okay. Um, so all that's just been really a, a gift to me, um, that kind of uh, intellectual conversation and, 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 and kind of iron sharpening iron. That's great. That's so great, Max. I appreciate hearing that. Um, maybe, maybe kind of on that on that point, we could just talk a little bit more specifically about like the research project. So I'm really interested mm -hmm. in this kind of intersection point between science and theology. And so I think you mentioned kind of like the health sciences. Like, how do you like as a New Testament professor, a New Testament scholar, approach like this very different field, and yet put that in conversation with your area of expertise in in Pauline studies? On the topic, yeah, you're it's on, of a it's it's a high learning curve, um, mm. but I am really grateful yeah. that the Henry Center has provided resources for me to get a jump on it. So um, I've been talking, for example, with um, Bill Struthers. Uh, he's a professor of psych uh, psych psychology at uh, the School of Psychology at Wheaton College, and um, the Henry Center actually got me connected with him. And he's kind of been an advisor mm. on my project. And so I get cool. to talk to him mm. about some of the work that I do. And he points me to the kind of the reading that I need to do. I have found the, the engagement with neurology and how the, the, our, our bodies process pleasure to be really helpful. Mm. Um, it's given me an ability to kind of understand. So uh, one, I needed to come with a definition of pleasure or, or what components of pleasure the pleasure there is. And dealing with the neurosciences um, helped me to understand that that pleasure, at least how we experience it, it, it comes in three parts. So for example, we, mm -hmm. we delight in something. So that's a euphoric experience. Um, pleasure also includes desiring after something. So, um, so what the neuro neurologists call it hedonic motivation. Um, mm -hmm. So, and sure. then also there's a valuation component. Sometimes we think back mm -hmm. 
and we find something more pleasurable because of the meaning we attach to it. So my my joke is is that um, everyone hates camping when they do it, but when they look back, it's it's the funnest experience ever. So I mean, it's such a strange Midwest thing that I discovered where you're out in the cold, and you're absolutely miserable. But then I it's do terrible. agree that when I look back on it, oh, that was fun. So um, so those three things: the the actual experience of delight, um, the longing for something, and having that satisfied and then also looking back and attaching meaning to it th that's mm. something that the health sciences have done a lot of work in and then what i've discovered is that a remarkable um, coalescing of information with the biblical material um, if you were for, for example just take all the greek words for pleasure in mm. the new testament they fit into one of those three domains some words mm. talk about delight interesting um, so some words talk about wanting, epithumia in Greek, uh, Paul's favorite word for desire, talks about longing for something. And then valuation, um, uh, some, when something is pleasing to us, we look back and, and, and God is pleased with us. We are, you know, we, we are a source of God's pleasure as well. All of this language is there. So uh, that helps me kind of frame my engagement with uh Scripture, and so I'm very much interested in the dialogue between the two disciplines, and mm -hmm. uh, I think there's dangers about collapsing the disciplines into a generic uh, oneness. That so I'm trying to maintain the the integrity of both disciplines, but I think there's an overlap, and they speak to each other. Interesting. Well, that's that, that's really cool. Maybe if I can just follow up br briefly, you mentioned um, uh, you kind of foreshadowed this, but. I, as someone who's done a lot of ministry and is ordained and, and and serves in these various ministry capacities, how do you how do you hope this is going to impact in the church in how one does pastoral ministry or how one thinks about you know incorporating these mm -hmm. these these biblical themes? Uh, what do you yeah what do you hope is the kind of the, the payoff for this in the church? Yeah, um, that's a so I I think um, I'm going to refer to a. a, a, a uh, Client Snodgrass's book. So Client Snodgrass was a professor of New Testament. He's most, most best known for his book on parables. Um, but yeah. he wrote a smaller book called Between Two Truths, mm -hmm. where he says Christian life is not actually one extreme or the other, but kind of a razor edge walk between two extremes, maintain the tension between both. So he talks about faith and works. He talks about uh, freedom and responsibility. And I think um, with, with pleasure, uh, you know, it, it it's, I want to maintain two extremes. We are, pleasure is a gift from God. Mm. Um, and he has given us um, gustatory pleasures. So that's food and drink. And I think within the, within the boundaries and, and covenant of marriage, uh, hu human intimacy is, is a gift. Uh, there's friendships a gift, so there's social pleasures. Um, but, uh, and so there, so we're called to enjoy that fully, but, the danger of pleasure, so this is where the tension comes in, it can get mm. addictive and idolatrous really fast. Mm. And so I think Christ, the, the gift to the church that I want to bring is, I, I want to talk about how, th it, how pleasure operates so that we can enjoy pleasure as a gift from God while avoiding the other extreme about addiction and idolatrous practice. And I don't think we do this mm. well. I think mm. most Christians Great. have a secular model for how to engage pleasure. We're, we're basically, uh, we practice moderation, but there's nothing Christian about moderation. Yeah. So we know mm -hmm. that too much pleasure hurts us and we think that too, uh, and then, uh, but then life huh. you know, is meant to be enjoyed and we don't have a Christian ethics of pleasure. And so mm -hmm. that, and, and we don't disciple through it. And I think in a world where because of technology, we get access to things faster than we ever done before, um, the church is going to be challenged by an epic, a different type of epidemic or pandemic, a uh, pandemic of unhealthy behavior when it comes to pleasure. Mm. So the book's payoff mm. is that I want that book to inform the work and discipleship of the church. Oh, that sounds and practically, really I've seen str the strangest things in ministry where uh, really brilliant college students, for example, get so addicted to online gaming that they flunk out of school. Uh, wow. That happened to a disciple of mine that was uh, that when I was ministering to them in Berkeley, and so uh, we know that pornography is a big issue even among seminarians. And so I do think that. So I think about my sons who are young men, ones already graduated, sure. ones in college. Um, in the end, this book is for them. So, 
So that That's so awesome. I have a lot of yeah. personally investment in this book. I totally see that. I mean, we are such an entertainment driven culture. I, this yeah. just strikes me as kind of right at the heart of the conversations churches need to be having. So I'm really grateful mm -hmm. that you're working on this. Well, uh, related to conversations that the church needs to be having, I'm going to mm -hmm. kind of transition us, if you don't mind. One of the things that, at least uh, in my Twitter world, Max and I are basically Twitter friends, really. Yeah, we are. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, in my Twitter world, I'm hearing quite a bit of great stuff about the Asian American Biblical Interpretation Research Group that you helped to convene um, at the Institute for Biblical Research. And so I guess I, I just want to hear why. I want to hear your vision for that group. Uh, why Why did you start that? What do you think it has to offer? Why is it a passion of yours? I'm just really excited to hear you talk about it. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. And it's, it's hard. let me, um, well, I first have to give credit <laughs> to the co-chair for the Asian American Representation Group at IBR, and that's Milton Ang. So credit really goes right. to him for taking initiative to uh, put everything administratively in place to start the group. And he had, called me uh, and asked me if I would consider being a chair. And I think it was providential because uh, I was stepping down from another position, the Intertextuality Group at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature. Sure. Yeah. And, and this issue has been burning in my heart for over 10 years. Mm. Uh, so mm. I've, uh, I've been a part of the Korean Biblical Colloquium and some other groups that try to understand how does our social, cultural, and ethnic ethnic location and form the way we read the biblical text. Yeah. And the reason, and yeah. so there's actually two things why I think this group is important. One, um, because every person has a unique history. Every community has a unique history. God's word speaks to them in that history. And what, what God says to that uh, particular um, community, I think is applicable for the whole body of Christ. And if you mm -hmm. only listen mm -hmm. to uh, how God speaks to certain communities and not others, we actually don't hear the whole story. So mm. um, what? Okay. how has God spoken to Asian Americans uh, living in a North American context or broadly Asians around the world? And how they have, how have they stood God's word, how they sought to faithfully live that out? What? How can that inform the practice of those outside those communities and ethnic groups in the water body of Christ? I think that's a very important part and scripture informs everything that we do how we read scripture is is how we're going to live out our faith and so the asian american group interpretation group it, it really is seeking to connect communities with the bible but communities with in their particular ethnic cultural and social location um hmm. and the second part of why this group started was because to uh, it's not just asian americans but to be let's say a person of color and a Bible scholar mm -hmm. and try to yeah. be, and try to serve the church as a theological educator. That's a very lonely road. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I often it. equate it to the image of uh, building, uh, making bricks without straw. And mm -hmm. so you're, you're, mm -hmm. we're called to, uh, we, we, ex we experience unexpected adversity in our vocation with no resources other than our own gut and, and, and God's grace, which is more than enough many times, uh, all the time actually, uh, hmm. to, to see us through. So I think the job of our group is to provide some of the straw as people are trying hmm. to live out their vocational call, give them the resource they need, um, advice, support, um, uh, you know, you know, people that bounce their ideas off of, uh, you know, someone that engage their research. Um, Milton and I are thinking of what can we do about mentoring networks for rising scholars? Yeah. Uh, mm. So all that's in the play. And um, to be honest, it's a little bit overwhelming because there's so much on the table that we want to do and we can only take things uh, one part at a time. But we are, we started it and we're going to try to see it through it and we'll see what the Lord does with it. So. Absolutely. Now, of course, uh, like not being a person of color, there are a lot of things about this experience I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But one corollary is as a female in the academy, I do recognize sometimes thinking through my social location and what that looks like. And I don't I, I don't know if, if you ever have the struggle, but I can't constantly find myself on the one hand wanting to be like, 
I'm not a female interpreter. I'm just an interpreter. I'm just reading the Bible. Don't mm. ask me what it means to be a female. I'm just reading. Sure. But on the other hand, every now and again, I find myself being like, no, I really do have a unique perspective. What does it look like for you to balance those two? Mm. I don't. Maybe you don't feel both of those impulses, uh, no, but uh, what, oh, no, how I do you do. process um, those things? Mm. I, yeah, I think... You know, I'm I'm kind of feeling my way through the dark at the same same, same, mm, I, same I think the same as uh, as many people. Um, so I I I do read. I mean, there are times when I read God's word, and and I do my work as a uh, historian, as a biblical exegete, as a grammarian, as someone who's trying to see what the text. Is is saying in its time, and then thinking theologically about how to apply it in, in mine. And yeah. I'm unconsciously aware of my um, Asian American identity, but many times because of the the communities that I serve, almost always when I get to the level of teaching and preaching, that my Asian identity come kicks in because I do think about um, you know how does this speak to the struggles of uh, Korean churches or or Asian American churches more broadly, um, if I'm called to preach there on Sunday, uh, someone's invited me to come and preach or give a Bible study series. Um, mm. I just did one, for example, in the Book of Revelation uh, for a, yeah. a Korean American church in Powell's time, what we call an EM English speaking ministry, and I had a great time okay. of fellowship. And um, so, I don't have uh, a way to give advice on how to maneuver through it other than I think it's fairly <laughs> fairly fluid. Um, it is a yeah, little bit unconscious. Right. I kind of swing, move in and out of both my role as a theological educator and given certain tools and then my identity as an Asian American scholar. Um, I, I think I live into yeah. both and simultaneously and sometimes they're disruptive. Sometimes I do find that s the... Um, Things that are being taught in my discipline or are being trained in isn't adequate to meet the needs of my community. And therefore, that's where the dissonance comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a good word. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks. Max, for yeah. kind of sharing about that. I do have one more request for you. Mm -hmm. We sure. have a lot of Asian American students at Trinity yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, experiencing all sorts of things. Um, but I wonder, uh, you've already articulated, at least as a Cre uh, Korean American um, scholar, you have spelt, you've felt some alienation and some isolation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any encouraging word for our students who might be experiencing some of those same things? Yeah. yeah um, I would say, uh, one, um, know that you've been called. So in mm -hmm. the end, I would put an umbrella. umbrella. Uh, if I, I believe if you're at a seminary and God has not called you there. He's going to let you know, and 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 and, and he'll, he'll let you know fairly quick. So, mm -hmm. one, hang on to your calling that God has got brought brought you to Trinity or to any other seminary or school um, for, uh, for for a reason and purpose. Uh, discover what that purpose is, and and be excited when the Lord unveils that to you. I would also say mm -hmm. um, try not to um, persevere alone. Try to persevere mm -hmm. communally. So, reach out to people. And I would say also um, open up spaces where it's not just me and other Asian Americans kind of supporting one another, but invite others who would you know, appreciate and understand some of the struggles uh, that I'm going through. There might be those that aren't or they're just too busy and they, they, they might not be available, but um, I, I would like it to liken it to this. Um, if, if I just go to Trinity and just try to get my degree. Um, I'm kind of like um, someone who's in the worship band and I'm just stuck on, okay, I gotta play this piece. I gotta play this piece. I gotta play this piece. And I'm not singing uh, with the other band members. I'm not worshiping with the rest of the community. I'm not enjoying the experience. I'm just trying to get it done and get and, 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 and make sure that I perform my piano piece and my guitar piece well and, and I'm not worshiping. And I think that um, as tough it as it is, we got to find those moments where we're really enjoying what we're studying, we're enjoying the time that we're spending with people, um, find those who have the same struggles that, uh, as you. And if they don't, then who are open to hearing what those struggles are and, and they have the space in their heart to really 
uh, try to understand what one's going through. And I think if you can enjoy your seminary education and enjoy the community mm -hmm. that that's a part of that seminary education, then you'll walk away with more than the the goal that you first came uh, when you when you entered into Trinity's campus. So that mm -hmm. would be my 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 word of advice. So um, and, and that's born from both success and failure. Um, mm -hmm. I would say personally, the education was. Uh, hard, burdensome, tiring when I was trying to do it all on my own, tough it out. And mm -hmm. I think the Lord really humbled me in many ways where uh, he put me in situations where me, myself, and I couldn't dig me out of whatever pit I was in. And mm -hmm. yeah. learning to humbly depend on others uh, and see, experiencing God through people was kind of the most formative experiences that I ever had. And it's one of the reasons why, even though I could have gotten my doctorate a lot sooner if I just focused on finishing the program, I think um, living life in the church and, and being engaged with the community at, at Fuller at, at that time really helped form me as the kind of person I am today. So I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Mm. That's great. Oh, that, that's so encouraging. Thanks for, for, for sharing that word. I'm, yeah, I, I feel exhorted in that as well. And I hope our, our students <laughs> do uh, too. Um, but but that's just the forward for us. <laughs> so we're, we're so we're so delighted uh, so delighted to have you with us, uh, Dr. Lee. It's been a pleasure to to talk with you. Yes. Uh, to to the listeners, be sure to check out uh, Max Lee's work. You can find his webpage off the North Park webpage and see you know, some of his uh, recent publications. Um, also on the Henry Center website, there's uh, some some things you can find uh, from Dr. Lee. There, there's some talks going to be coming up as well uh, that you can you can check out there. So so uh, be sure to, to pay attention to the good research and the good work that, that he is doing. We're grateful that he was able to uh, speak with us uh, today. So, um, And we're also grateful to the many people who helped this podcast work. We're grateful to Curtis Pierce, our, our producer. Uh, grateful to Lauren, our, our graduate assistant, uh, our other co-hosts as well who, who make this a success. And, and we're also grateful to you, our listeners and, and viewers who uh, participate along with us on social media um, and the like. So until next time, I'm James Arcadi. And I'm Michelle Knight. Thanks, everybody. Forward is a podcast hosted by faculty at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. The views expressed by the hosts and guests of Forward do not necessarily represent the views of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. You can subscribe to our newest episode on your preferred podcast app or at forwardpodcast.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Forward Podcast to get updates and additional links to content. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School is located 25 miles north of Chicago with extension sites across the country and online. Trinity educates men and women to engage in God's redemptive work in the world by cultivating academic excellence, Christian faithfulness, and lifelong learning. You can find more information at teds.edu.